Hey guys, welcome back to 10 more super obscure RPGs that are great. Today there's a bunch of games from all over the world, including a lot of surprisingly good indie RPGs. So let's begin! Number 10. Shines The Lightning Kingdom Shines is an indie action RPG from French studio Enigami. It was a successful Kickstarter, but unfortunately the studio declared bankruptcy after this game was released. Despite being quite good, unique and interesting, it was a commercial failure. It is based on a web manga, apparently, taking place in the fictional world of Mahera. It lives off of Shi, the vital energy which balance has been broken, leading some races to war. In hopes of seeing his deceased mother again, Shadow embarks on a journey to lead the Shinest Hera to the mysterious lands of life. Of course he'll do so with the help of other characters in the middle of the aforementioned war. So you'll explore a large island full of puzzles, locked routes and dangers, but with beautiful visuals. Controls feel fine no matter where you go or what you do. You can switch between every party member available since they all have different skills to help you with a puzzle or with a specific part of the game. In combat though, you can only control one character. Usually you fight against one single enemy in a small area. Defeating the enemy might make another one appear sometimes. Controls are reminiscent of a 3D beat-em-up which are responsive but also combo based. You can also use Xi for different types of attacks. It's basically a fighting system in 3D and it plays out decently. It's got good story, interesting characters, engaging combat, alluring exploration and memorable music. However, my two problems with this game are that some enemies can be extremely difficult to fight or to defeat, you have to know how to approach them in battle and with which character or else it'll be impossible to take them down. Another problem I have is the lack of a good map, you won't get lost but sometimes you won't know where to go, and when you do, good luck backtracking all the way to get there cause nothing teleports you anywhere here. Other than these complaints, this is still a pretty solid game with a twist in combat. It's only on PS4, Xbox One and Windows though, not on Switch. Number 9. This Way Madness Lies A ladies only theater group inspired by Shakespeare plays is also the bearer of magical powers. The girls use them to change their outfits and fight in Shakespearean worlds and nightmares. Developed by the same studio who did Cosmic Star Heroine, this is a turn-based RPG with colorful visuals, fast interface and good-looking animations. Obviously the soundtrack is excellent as with any game from these guys. No towns are here whatsoever and no stores, only your combat menu equipment system and skill tree system. Every girl will learn different abilities that can only be used once per battle. Well, most of them anyway. Up to 8 can be equipped by every character in the menu and you can switch between them at any time, except during battle of course. As I said, you won't be able to use most of the same abilities twice unless you spend a whole turn to recharge them all. Elemental strengths and weaknesses are here, as well as a variety of buffs, debuffs and status effects. Those play a major role in combat, so be sure to take advantage of them on your end. I really enjoy this ability system which is also seen similarly on most of their previous games. It makes battles awesome. Finally, the skill tree. Girls will learn mostly passive skills as they level up, but you can only equip 3. An interesting penalty to avoid abusing the system. The game's challenging but not exactly hard, so anybody can easily jump into it. This comedy is fun, addicting, and it can be completed in about 5 to 7 hours max. It's on Switch, PS5 and Windows. Number 8. Succubus Apothecary Risa. Or is it Risa? Anyway, this is a turn-based RPG developed by one person in RPG Maker MV Player. It's completely free, all you need to do is download the RPG Maker demo on any modern console, also free, which lets you play tons of small games developed with the software. I've played my fair share of them and this is the best one so far. You play as Risa or Risa, who used to be a completely perverted succubus <laughs> but has now turned her life around the church. She's still the town's apothecary, so doing quests to increase her business is necessary. But then bad things happen and she ends up getting involved into all sorts of trouble. The humor of this game is offensive, incorrect, lewd and with strong language included. 
the type of writing I wish we could see more often in JRPGs nowadays, but probably never will. In other words, I freaking love the writing, the characters and the story, it's a great comedy. The rest, gameplay-wise, is pretty basic, a traditional styled RPG where you visit different towns and areas with an overworld in between, it's got random encounters, sometimes too often, sometimes not. In combat, up to four characters can fight, each with HP and SP, but also TP. Those are basically technique points and you can use them if you have enough. Points fill up over time merely by fighting, or you can use items to recover them. It certainly adds a twist to battle, since the RNG numbers are so exaggerated here with over-the-top damage. But it also makes combat feel great, also thanks to its cool animations. While the characters are all chibi, the enemies are in full size and there are some cool-looking monsters and bosses around, but these graphics and design and also the music are all courtesy of the software itself, but they were implemented very well in the game. There's not much else to say despite some really small gathering and synthesis mechanics, but it's all pretty basic stuff. It also has a large variety of characters and party members. If you want to play a great modern RPG Maker game, this is one I can definitely recommend. Number 7. Grand Guilds This is an indie strategy RPG from a Philippine studio based on a Kickstarter. You play as a guild of warriors that work for the Triton Empire. Eliza, the protagonist, has a strong personality, but she follows orders from the mysterious Lyria. After a few missions, warriors from other guilds start joining Eliza and crew, slowly turning the plot against the Empire. The gameplay is pretty basic as we get to watch some dialogue until we return to this little overworld map. Here you can choose the next main mission or fight through some side quest battles. Some of them actually involve scenes and connect with the characters. This is also where you can use the menu to check stats and change your card decks. That's right, there's a card system and a really good one. Every character can equip a deck of 15 cards total, all ranging from attacks or spells to buffs or debuffs. There are also passive skills you can equip your characters with, unlocking more slots as you progress through the story. Money is used to unlock more cards but not skills. Characters learn those automatically as the story progresses. Ok, on to the battle mechanics. It's a grid-based strategy RPG, there are 9 characters total in the game, but only 3 can participate in battle, usually against a small group of enemies or a boss. Everyone has only 5 action points, and moving also costs 1 point, although there are cards that let you execute an attack and jump straight to your enemy at the same time. But as you may have guessed, each card costs points too. So you need to strategize there and decide which card or cards to use on every character's turn. It's intuitive and engaging to say the least, the game's great with excellent narrative and character development. Unfortunately, the developer didn't really test it properly, all versions, including Steam, suffer from technical issues. Glitches, bugs and lag during certain scenes or battles. Most scenes lack music and sound effects, making them awkward to watch in complete silence, especially the console versions which got the worst treatment. But by far the most annoying issue on them is moving the cursor in battle. You only use it with the joystick, not the D-pad, so it's hard to make it appear to select your characters or move around with the terrain or the camera angle often getting in the way. You have to be in the right camera angle to make the cursor appear and work properly. Jesus! But you know what, despite all of its problems, this is still an excellent game! If you can put up with all the unpleasant technicalities, you'll find yourself with an RPG that's surprisingly good for a low-budget work from a very small team of people. Number 6. Sword of the Vagrant this is a Chinese indie RPG heavily inspired by Vanillaware games, you know, Odin Sphere, Dragon's Crown, Muramasa, and of course it shows. It's got colorful and overly beautiful backgrounds and world design, but also over-the-top characters like Vivian the protagonist. She's a sailsword tormented by the loss of her family, but one day she gets caught up in a pact with a witch from the organization she hates to do her bidding. Accompanied by a meddlesome kid, she travels the world in search for her missing father. Stories edgy, well written and with great narrative. I mean, for a short adventure that can be completed in 10 to 12 hours, with multiple routes and endings by the way, I need to praise it. 
The gameplay is traditional with a few towns with areas and dungeons in between. In town you can do the usual which is talk to people, break stuff, find items, buy and sell stuff like equipment, etc. Weapons and armor can also be upgraded and you can even attach some materials into them to get different buffs. As you've been seeing so far, it's a 2D action RPG with good controls. Not as good as the Vanillaware games though, but come on, it's an indie game, you gotta give them a break. You have no party members whatsoever and only play as Vivian the entire adventure. She has a few combos that depend on the direction you're fighting, including up and down, or when you're jumping. Sometimes she needs to complete the combos and the reaction time to move around or backwards can leave her exposed. So the game's challenging alright, especially the boss fights, but that's a good thing since there's barely anything frustrating in terms of difficulty. If you die, you respawn from the last save, which are usually the nearest campfires, so no problem. Instead of picking up food and eating it like in Odin's Fear, you just run or walk through it, or across it, and recover automatically. Same with any other item or money out there. Now, the map layout is designed like in a Metroidvania game. As you see, there's a crap ton of areas to cover and you either use a teleporter to go back to faraway places or you need to manually take Vivian there by running. It can be stressful to do, but this is also a good way to find treasure, healing items, experience and sometimes better equipment. Soundtrack is incredible here with a lot of killer tracks. Overall, this is a really good game. It's available on all modern systems and it's a blast to play. There's also a great New Game Plus, so you can be overpowered and easily get the other routes and endings you may have missed. Definitely check this one out! Number 5. Monochrome Mobius I made a full review of this game last year, but I wanted to cover it again because I feel it needs more attention. There's also some kind of misunderstanding about the series it belongs to. It's part of the Uta Wareru Mono universe, a bunch of visual novel strategy RPGs. Chronologically speaking, this is the second game, but you do not need to play any of the others to understand this. It's almost completely standalone. You play as Oshtor, whose goal is to become a knight of the Mikado Empire, but then he encounters Shunya, and then she tells him his father is still alive after he helped her escape from bad guys from a faraway land. So this gives Ashtar two purposes in the game, join the Mikado and find his father. The gameplay is traditional with a major town serving as a base of operations, but there are some others you'll visit throughout the overworld. No random encounters exist here, thankfully, and enemies aren't hard to avoid if you don't want to fight. But if you're a bit above their level, you can just one-shot them without getting into battle. This is a great way to grind for experience, money and items, since the game does not pull any punches, man. It's quite challenging. You'll die here if you aren't on the right level regardless of your equipment or strategy. But the combat is really good. Remember Grandia? Well, it's a bit like it. Some of your attacks can push the enemy's turn back, some can be used to accelerate yours. They can do the same to you too, though. Apart from that, you've got your regular skills, elemental attacks, buffs, debuffs, etc. It's really engaging. The music's pretty thematic here, it easily transports you to areas like the Edo period in Japan, even though the setting is entirely fictional. Graphics are a treat, especially in some areas like the overworld. It's an excellent game. Like I said, I did a full review of this game, I'll leave it at the end in case you want to know more. Number 4. Banner of the Maid I covered this game recently, so I'll be as quick as I can. This grid-based strategy RPG from China made some noise when it came out. Fans were saying the game was awesome, but they probably and primarily played it for the plot. Oh yeah. Jokes aside, it's about the French Revolution, but instead of playing as Napoleon Bonaparte, you play as his sister, Pauline. It's a campaign to fight in the war with several units under your command, but every character is merely a commander of a small platoon of soldiers during battle. After moving on grids and selecting your target, this battle animation plays out. Graphics are small as you can see, but quite detailed, though the game's visuals shine more with the art style and character design. Side quests, including character quests and points with the different factions play a role here, but not a big one for the ending, there's just one and also only one route, although a few battles and allies might diverge depending on your choices. No permadeath exists here, thankfully, except for one important character based on the choice system I mentioned. I recommend reading a guide to save this character, but letting it live means you miss another one. 
A strength and weaknesses system exists here based on the character class and the weapon they use, similar to the Fire Emblem series. The isometric view helps getting a better understanding of the battlefield, something I usually don't appreciate. Anyway, this is an excellent RPG, quite challenging but also quite addicting to play. You can find it on all modern systems. Number 3. Fire Emblem Requiem This is a fan-made hack by Sacred Blaze based on the GBA titles. Why am I including a hack here? Because I never do, and I've always wanted to talk about one, so I picked my favorite of them all. It uses the assets from the Blazing Sword, which means it plays exactly the same. Triangle system for the weapons, grid-based movement, terrain and weather-affected areas, weapon-breaking system, and permadeath for most characters. Oh yeah, old school Fire Emblem, baby. But the map design, the sprites, the music and support conversations are 100% original. The game's got two protagonists, siblings Val and Ash from the noble house of Olva. An enemy house, a garde, declares war on them so they must defend themselves, but eventually they end up separated as there seems to be something really, and I mean really dark with Ash. The story is excellent, top notch, on the same level than most official Fire Emblem titles. That's the great thing about fan made games or indie titles, that sometimes they prove to have much better and original writing than some of the mainstream games. Requiem is composed by 26 chapters, and it gets progressively hard on normal mode. It's just as challenging as the title from this era, especially near the end. The pacing is also greatly executed as the variety in enemies, their position and the map design is well crafted. Besides, it doesn't waste your time with meaningless dialogue or annoying early spikes. If you're a fan of the series, do yourself a favor and try this one out. I've played several hacks already and this easily takes the crown. Strongly recommend it and, well, the best thing of it all, it's free! Number 2 Danganronpa, another episode Ultra Despair Girls. This is a spin-off of the anime and visual novel games from the series, but most people aren't aware of this little gem. It was released originally on the PS Vita, later ported to PS4 and Windows. You control Komaru, a high school girl trying to survive and also escape from a city completely overrun by evil kids controlling evil Monokuma robots. They're trying to kill off every single adult in existence, including her. So she teams up with the crazy Toku, another student, one with multiple personality disorder. The shy with no filter, awkward girl, and the psychopath murdering machine known as Genocide Jill. You'll play through areas and buildings as you find your way out, eventually leading to a boss fight. You control Komaru most of the time, but you can switch to Jill at any time. However, Jill requires weird batteries to be able to fight, so once they're depleted, you'll switch back to Komaru automatically. She uses a megaphone, supposedly a hacking gun, meaning she's the third person shooter part with shoulder controls whereas Jill uses her large scissor blades to hack and slash her enemies. Obviously, she's more powerful, but as I mentioned, you can only use her for a short period of time. As you make progress, the girls will also find puzzles to solve, usually involving the monokumas. This is where most of the hacking gun abilities come into play, like scanning an area to look for clues, items or switches to activate certain things, but also to fight enemies in different ways. You get coins by defeating them, which can also be used to upgrade the girls' weapons. A variety of skills will also be unlocked as you advance, most of them being passive though. The game's got an amazing soundtrack worth listening to outside of the game and beautifully colorful graphics. Now, this is not really an RPG, it's merely an adventure game. I only included it in the video for two reasons. One, because it's ridiculously original and good, with amazing humor, dark as hell themes and even some survival horror elements and two, because it's like a tradition to include a great hidden gem that's not really an RPG in this video series. Anyway, do yourself a favor and check this excellent game out. Number 1. Might and Magic – Clash of Heroes Surprise! This is a western RPG, even though it has an anime style of character design. 
Developed by Canadian studio Capybara Games, who were known back then for creating mobile games, until Ubisoft got involved with their might and magic IP to create this addictive masterpiece. It was originally released as an exclusive on the Nintendo DS, which is the version I've been playing for over a decade, later enhanced for PS3, 360, PC and phones, digital only. Last year, a full remake of it was launched on PS4 and Switch, but I've yet to play it. Let me say this right off the bat, this is my favorite non-Japanese RPG of all time. You play as five protagonists, one for each chapter like in Odin Sphere, a great story about all of them getting sent to different parts of Ashan, the world also seen in Heroes of Might and Magic 5 for computer systems. No need to play that one to understand this game, as it's considered as a prequel. Anyway, each protagonist will journey with a sidekick to reunite with the others and put a stop to the demon lord Ash from engulfing the world in chaos. You explore like this to talk to people, enter places, recruit creatures and, of course, fight in puzzle battles. Every protagonist controls a small army of creatures in a turn-based system. The goal is to make vertical rows of three to have them charge up and attack. Each attack, though, needs a few turns to charge. Once they're ready, they'll advance automatically at the start of the next turn. Any creature can destroy barriers, which are created in horizontal rows of three creatures of the same kind as well. They can also destroy enemies of any size and ultimately harm the enemy commander. But if the enemy has any creature charging, they'll only damage it or destroy it if you're lucky. To have a large creature of your own charge, you need two regular monsters of the same color below them, or four for the big ones, the most powerful ones. Now, every protagonist has a unique skill to them that they can use after having caused and or received a lot of damage. You only have three actions per turn, but using your skill doesn't require one. Enemy commanders, controlled by the computer, can do absolutely everything I just explained to you as well. The more you fight, the more experience you get and level up both your characters and their creatures. This game is ridiculously addicting, and you can also play just endless quick battles against the other heroes or sidekicks outside of the story mode. It's a personal addiction of mine, and one of my favorite video games across all genres. Great graphics, well-written story, extremely unique combat, good music, it's got everything to be one of the most original RPGs ever created. Alright, those were 10 more strongly recommended super obscure RPG gems, worldwide edition I guess. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe and share this video with your friends. See you next time!